Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny in Colombo. This is a special report on the current economic crisis here in Sri Lanka. We're trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, in the news uh, around 9 o'clock, we saw on um, First at 9 and also uh, in, in World News what's happening in the world. Um, COVID has been the main catalyst for where we are right now. Uh, lots of things have happened in the past two weeks, which has impacted a lot. Uh, for you and me, what's happening on the ground, if you go into a shop, you would understand the economic conditions Sri Lanka is going through right now. Now, yes, we can lament, we can scream, we can do all those kinds of things, but that is not going to solve our problems. Because apparently, if, we, um, if that does, that means we would have already sorted all the problems we have in this country, uh, considering the amount of uh, complaining we do on a daily basis. In order to have this conversation, where we go from here, what should we do, and how can we get out of this current situation, I'm uh, glad to be joined by the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank here in Sri Lanka, uh, Bingumal Devara Thantri. Uh, good to see you, Bingumal. Thank you very much for, good to see you uh, in person this time around. Um, we are here in this situation, <laughs> uh, trying to figure out uh, who did what and what uh, policies led us to this. is a useless conversation. Now, uh, today the current government has said, yes, they are going to seek IMF support. That is going to happen. Uh, Finance Minister Basil Rajapaksa will head to Washington and the discussions will begin. Opposition quarters are saying it's too late anyways for the IMF, this and that. That is a redundant conversation. Economically, as a CEO of a, a well-reputed bank here in Sri Lanka and, and, and a bank that is dealing with lots of international and local elements, how do you see this decision to go to the IMF? Do you think it's the prudent one that we need right now? Yeah, so Mahesh, it's important to understand the context. Uh, we have $4 billion of external debts. Total outflows are when initially when we estimated in January to about six four billion for this year. This year, external debts and about six billion total outflows, including you know uh, current account deficit to SLDBs to everything uh, in January before Ukraine Russia war. Uh, so at, even at that time, the popular opinion was a debt restructuring. Now whether you do that with IMF or not is a choice of the government. Uh, I, I believe that the government has started negotiating some of the bilateral debts at a very early stage. But now we are in a situation where we can see a widening current account deficit, though we have, you know, floated the dollar, we have controlled some of the imports. Uh, exports can only do, you know, a, a particular level. It's hovering around 1.1, 1.2. You cannot suddenly take it to 1.5. So very clearly we have, a, of course, the worker remittances will improve uh, with the devaluation, but very clearly we have, a, you know, widening current account deficit with the fuel price going up. Uh, because that itself can add another two and a half to three billion dollars of stress to the current mm -hmm. account deficit. It is happening. Right. So with that, I mean, we are just four months. I mean, if you look at the outflows from now to July, we have four billion dollars. Forget the external, internal piece, uh, including SLDBs and, and current account deficit. All the outflows around four billion with interest running up to July. So and with $2.3 billion of uh, reserves, we, we are negotiating a $1 billion bilateral with India. We have half a billion dollars of our energy you know, uh, line given by India as well. Uh, today, there was news around negotiating another line for diesel, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, those are all credit lines. Credit lines you have to settle someday. Those are short term in nature. So we need a sustainable solution because we don't know I mean, uh, the Ukraine-Russia war, oh. how long it will last. So and it's going to impact us. It has impacted already. It has impacted the globe, the palladium and, and nickel and all these metals have gone through the roof. Uh, energy has gone to 130, 140 mm -hmm. and come back. Uh, but it will, the averages last year was around 71 per barrel. This year, uh, we, for, the, for the moment, we are forecasting 84, 85, it can easily reach 90, 95. That's where we are. So in that context, I think debt restructuring is critical. Uh, when I say debt restructuring, it can be a soft and shallow debt restructuring. You simply postpone. It can be debt restructuring with the haircut. There are three, four types of debts. You have bilats, multilats, and international sovereign bonds. Whether you want to exclude international sovereign bonds or not, so those are things that I think the government should now discuss with the IMF. IMF is definitely a choice. Uh, I think uh, we are late, in my view, uh, better late than ever. Exactly. Uh, Bingo Ma, you said a lot of things. Um, one of the key things that people out there need to understand is uh, 
yes, we understand this whole conversation about we've taken a lot of debt for a longer period of time. We did not manage our economy uh, in a healthy way. And there were policies, decisions taken in the past, past 73 years that has led to this particular point. A pandemic has come and pretty much uh, evaporated whatever we were having, slowly building whatever that went uh, out of the window. On top of that, we see a war in Ukraine slowly starting to come up, and that is also going to affect, directly it has affected oil. And if it affects oil, it affects Sri Lanka's uh, oil uh, purchase as well, which means oil is everything here in Sri Lanka as well. So that is happening right now. So when a person goes into the shop or the petrol pump or anywhere, if he got around 10 liters a day for 1,000 rupees, now he can only afford around 500, uh, 5 liters a, a day because of the dollar floating, um, rupee floating and the dollar going up and all that things are occurring. Now, why, what do you think we need to do immediately so that people would not get stressed so much? Because we know um, the central bank is saying, we have to take absorb the shock. Yeah, so, but people on the ground are going through this. So, what do you think, in your opinion, as you've seen, you know, outside? The, I'm pretty sure Standard Chartered Bank has seen this type of uh, crises all around the world, and you all would have advised in certain manner. So, in, in, in that opinion, with that institutional knowledge and memory, how, what do you think we need to do right now? Yeah, my sh first thing is I'll take you back to the whole debt story. We have a forty billion dollars of external debt. Um, out of that, China would be around 10. Japan is about 10. We have a larger component, about 10% for sure. I mean, uh, the total component is about $2.5 billion uh, onto international sovereign bonds. Now, some of, the, some of these ISBs are done for reserve management, planning for the future. Unfortunately, the COVID happened. We lost you know, mm. $8 billion of flows. Now, the energy crisis, more dollars for the petrol. Uh, there's a global supply chain disruption as well. We had to acknowledge that we've seen the inflation rising in blank markets like US and UK to a 30 years high level, 30 to 40 years in my view, uh, in those markets. So inflation is not a new thing for the world. It's, it's all over the world and it's, it's here to stay. Uh, it's going to stay for the next 18 months to or two years in our view. So interest rates are rising, the governments and the policymakers are tightening you know, fiscal policies. But coming down to Sri Lanka, we have a unique problem because of the low reserves. Now, one is supply chain disruption and the prices going up because of commodity crisis, but we have low reserves. So because of that, we are really struggling to import some of the important you know, goods, uh, imported, uh, imported important goods for the, for the economy. So in that context, yes, we will have to go through a difficult time. But as a country, I think what is important at this point is, I'm sure there's work happening, uh, to understand the cash flow better and tell the cash flow story better. Mm -hmm. to the outside investors and to the lenders you know mm -hmm. you have are you uh, talking about reserves per se here yeah reserves and the cash flow that is impacting the reserves so you have 2.3 billion we know there's a chinese swap also in within that that's another one and a half right you're expecting a one billion dollars of swap lines to come for uh, important commodities from india right you have half a billion of uh, you know uh, now a full you know uh, package from india so Mahesh, what is important is at this point to tell our story better you know, we, we need to really analyze the cash flow. I think well, work is happening, but uh, it's important to tell that to the investors and to the lenders. You know, what, that you have $2.3 billion of uh, reserves. Then you have a billion dollars of, uh, you know, swap lines that you're working on. There's a half a billion of uh, energy line that you've worked on already. Uh, then there are other bilateral conversations happening with China. So all that together with the FDIs, of course, there's a BOI pipeline, if I'm not mistaken, there's a healthy pipeline. How much can we close before July? Uh, then there was another recent energy transaction. I think it came to closure very much uh, closer to uh, closure. So that component is about $240 million. So all that together, running up to July, because running up to July, external, internal, we have $4 billion worth of outflows, right? Running up to July, including SLDB, right? So it's important to analyze and tell that story. I'm sure the analysis is happening, uh, but telling that story yeah. better to the lenders and, and the, uh, you know, the, uh, the investors would be critical at this point. Not uh, only to them, but we have to tell that story to our own people as well, because none of them understand uh, what's going on or what they see is pretty much into their line of sight. Uh, if they see there's a queue in at the petrol pump, they are not trying to go the extra mile in order to understand why that's happening.
what kind of global effects are impacting that particular decision and why people are going through this. Now that is a that is actually an educational uh, issue in terms of this country. The, I mean we are at a high literacy rate but when, when it comes to financial literacy I think we are at a very low level because that's why we see all these kinds of nonsense occurring and it's not helping the whole story. But now, Mahesh, if may I interrupt you there, uh, so there are queues in other countries as well. Exactly. Because of the price hikes. But we have queues solely because people are, have this fear of not having the commodities. So that's a different issue altogether. So that, I is, think that, that is stemming yeah. from the simple fact that we are not communicating properly to the people. If they know, uh, because some goon comes on uh, television and says, uh, you know, no fuel for I I within the next few uh, weeks, or, or, or better yet, that PUSL uh, chairman, he came and said, I don't have fuel in order to generate electricity. People translated that saying, okay, if he doesn't have uh, electricity, uh, fuel to generate electricity, that means there is no fuel in the country, so let's go and get whatever we can. Yeah. And that created another crisis. Yeah, what is important is in a situation like this to have the traffic lights. So when you s know your energy levels are coming down, uh, we should press certain buttons. That's how we run in the bank. So we have very clear cut, you know, risk triggers that we look at even for countries. We have okay, very clear cut risk triggers when the reserves come below a certain level, we take decisions. So similarly, I think we should proactively manage certain things. But the challenge is some of these ecter external sector challenges now becoming domestic challenges. Mm -hmm. It has happened already. You see in the gas lines and energy and uh, power cuts, right? Now that will lead to so slow growth. Growth will slow down and will also add to inflation. So you're ballooning the problem by postponing some of these activities. So uh, I, think, uh, I think a proactive approach uh, is critical. You asked the original question was, what do we do? A proactive approach is very, very important at this point. Um, proactive approach means if you had some kind of a policy decision as a government or an administration which is not helping this particular scenario, we have to throw that out of the window and we have to start fresh. Is that what? Uh, you no, no. The proactive action means you basically manage your reserves better. So you, when you see reserves coming below how four come, months, how come we are not managing that right now? What so, do you think? So the reserves issue? went down because, like I explained, there is supply chain disruptions, etc. We had debt settlements to do. We had bills to settle. So reserves came down. The tourism came down as a result of that. Also, with the currency caps, what happened was the worker remittances came down by 61. But there are multiple reasons to where you know, to explain where we are. But on only point that I'm trying to make is when you keep going down on the reserves, there are certain actions that you have to take. So you can't run with like four, six weeks of reserves. I think I think we should take immediate action now because three, at this point we are two point three billion dollars. That includes the swap we have. We have some inflows outflows. So understanding that we need to figure out how do we run till July. Mm. So IMF is definitely an option. But, but IMF is not going to inject cash tomorrow. Is, is, so is the way it works, so before IMF also, uh, Mahesh, I would like to say without before going into IMF, you can always work with the bilats. You can always go to your friendly nations, the Paris Club, uh, non-Paris and say, please help us. You can work on a three to four billion dollars of inflows. Some countries have done that. How, how much, in order to understand this entire conversation, how much of money do we need in order to be, in order to get out of this? What, what's the short the term? Four billion minimum. Minimum four billion, considering right now. Right now, right now at least. Yeah. And and um, with some amount of debt postponement. But my my problem will will not be over because we have another four billion next year. Going into next year, there'll be a lot of industries like the automotives industry. They have not imported for two years, mm -hmm. right? People will want to import some cars. Right? Some industries have not taken off. They will want to import tourism. Taking off, you need to import certain goods to support the tourists. So we have to open up imports. We can't go on with this import restriction forever. Moment you open up current account deficit, if you don't have the flows, there's a cash flow mismatch. So I think in our view, I think at least two years of debts to be restructured. You know, when I say restructured, you can postpone, you can take hair cut. There are multiple ways of doing it. That action should, and you know, you have to take it fast. If you don't have a bilateral support, by now. A uh, lot more to discuss uh, with the CEO of uh, Standard Chartered Bank, uh, Mr. Bingumal Thevra um, With regard to the current economic uh, situation here in uh, Sri Lanka, we're trying to understand uh, the nuances, where we, uh, why we are here and where we need to go. IMF seems to be the solution that the government is looking at right now. 
But like uh, uh, Bingumar said, that there has be always been a lot of conversation with bilateral partners, uh, trying to figure out where we can manage the debt and try to get uh, to a very comfortable place. Uh, that needs, l like what you said, $4 billion is the figure that we really need right now, but that is not going to sort our problem. So this is going to be a story that we have to tell over and over again. Let's take a short commercial break. You're watching the special report on the current economic crisis. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to this special report on the current economic crisis here in Sri Lanka. We're trying to understand the issue we are facing right now and exactly what needs to be done. Having a conversation with the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank um, in Sri Lanka, Bingumal Thevara Thamfi. Thevara Thamfi, uh, apologies there. Bingumal, um, this whole issue started cascading. It, it was there for quite some time, but it started cascading with the rupee being allowed to float. That was about uh, a week and a half back. So that happens and we saw the rippling effect of it and we are still seeing it. Uh, all prices are going on, the entire price structure is, is, is slashed and we are figuring out new prices in order to feel. And that new price is heavily being felt by the consumer. It's not a small uh, uh, up, upping of uh, uh, you know money, it is a huge considerable amount. In certain cases 30%, in certain cases 60% and uh, so on and so forth. Was floating the rupee the right decision? Yeah, I think also we need to understand the background to this. So the, the challenge was we, we kept the currency last year from April informally then then formally we kept the currency meaning and we didn't allow the markets that to the yeah yeah currency to go above a certain level just to give you the give you a context like the emerging market currency would depreciate by five to seven percent every year so exporters always plan this in their, their forecasting uh, worker remittances the workers will think always you get slightly more every year for your dollars dirhams whatever so uh, in that scenario also what happened was when we kept it for like almost one year formally informally what happened was um, a lot of informal channels got activated. Uh, importers got panicked. They started stockpiling. They started using some of the export flows to buy their goods. Uh, worker remittances came through other channels or didn't come at all. Worker remittances came down to uh, year on year, it was down by 61%. So, uh, so I don't think the policymakers had a lot of choice. So they had to float. But a free float in a scenario like this with with, without having proper reserves to intervene, it's a bit difficult for the country. That's where we are right now. So uh, we have done it already, so we need to find a way to deal with it. Uh, if the currency goes above a 250, uh, uh, we believe in the next 30 to 45 days, it'll normalize. There's a lot of good at, news at, about- At around uh, what, what figure? We cannot speculate at this point. Uh, the worker remittances will go up, and I, I, we hear a lot of positive news about it. Some amount of tourism income will also go up because some people view Sri Lanka as yeah. slightly cheaper location. Uh, exporters will, of course, they get encouraged. Uh, so to, for this, and also there, there's another interesting story. When this happened, there was a huge pending outstanding bill to settle from the importer's side. Some of the importers have imported from their parents on credit terms. So that runs into hundreds of millions, right? And some of the banks, when the devaluation happened, they had open positions. That means you are running a position thinking that you'll settle it tomorrow. Now, that again is a big number. Then you also have pending dividends mm -hmm. of, of multinationals. You also have the IIA payments, people who are invested in Sri Lanka trying to take the money back. That There's a big payable book outside the system. So th first of all, they will come to the market and buy the dollars and then the worker remittances will go up. At some point we saw the worker remittances going to a 700, 800 level. We believe it will go up. Uh, hopefully tourism flow will continue. We markets will shift from Russia to India. That will happen, but the tourism, we are very positive about it. Uh, so with that, the markets, we should normalize in the next 30 to 45 days, ideally that's, at that's, a certain level. That's the immediate future. Yeah, the level we cannot predict at this point, but I can tell you if it goes beyond 250 levels, the s fiscal stress will be enormous. Uh, the f inflation will rise. It again. is, uh, isn't it uh, above 250 right now? It is right now, but it's just one week after the float, so now it's just everybody's wait and watch kind of scenario. 
but we have to wait for another 30 to 45 days. Countries have done this, countries have come out after floating. So we cannot predict at this point about a future in, in exchange rate because it doesn't work as per the market forces. You know, there's a supply chain disruption, you have low reserves, there are multiple factors. Now, this is a small market, you have half a billion dollars, FDI is coming in, if central bank intervenes in the forex market, you know, uh, currency can improve. So there's multiple factors here, but our, our advice would be some level of formal or informal intervention to keep it at a, at a certain level. Um, there are talks about the rupee will actually uh, gain against the dollar and it'll come down to around 200 rupees, 180. Um, you don't see that ever happening? Very unlikely. There, there, I mean, economies fundament fundamentals wouldn't support that kind of an argument at this point. Uh, export market is absolutely, it's a good thing by allowing the rupee to be at the correct uh, uh, amount against the dollar and also if you look at certain other sectors which you explained, uh, tourism, uh, foreign worker uh, remittances and all those things, it's good. But is that all? Is that because the amount of prices that's going up right now, whether it's fuel, whether it's medicine, whether it's uh, uh, even food in certain staples, um, that's going up drastically. So do you see that also stabilizing in the... Uh, see, the currency, yeah. Because a lot of these uh, importers factored the currency risk at, I would say, 240, 250 levels. That's why I said if it comes down to that level, it's stable. I mean, of course, the prices will still go up. I mean, don't think you'll get the existing prices. Already food prices have gone up by 25% or mm. more. So prices will still go up. But uh, anything beyond that will be very difficult for Sri Lanka. How does the rupee floating is actually impacting the inflation levels in, in, in this country? Because we, we, we are looking at, I think, next month would be around more than 30%. Yeah, rupee floating or in emerging market currency, when it depreciates, inflation rises and there's impact on the growth and all of that. So that, that you cannot stop. So in, inflation, like I said, I mean, it, it's here to stay for some time, you know. It's going to be there for the next 18 months. That's why it's important that we arrest this, you know, get the reserves up. You know, uh, get, when you get the new flows, you divert those new flows into the important domestic sectors like fuel, gas, you know, energy, those sectors and, and essential commodities and pharma. Those are the most important commodities because, like I said before, you cannot create, you know, create a domestic problem because of an external sector issue. That will be catastrophic for, for tourism and other industries. Uh, not to r not trying to get political, but um, S Sri Lanka was looking, I mean, we were told that we are an import-oriented uh, economy uh, and we were moving away from an import to an export-oriented economy. Does floating the rupee and what's happening right now is helping that particular theory? So uh, currency devaluation has not always, you know, increased the imports drastically. Our import store is good. We've done 19% of import uh, year on year. I think, uh, sorry, export export book has grown by 19% year on year, which is a really good story in my in a pandemic with all these mm -hmm. challenges. Uh, but simply b because you devalue, exports wouldn't go up. You need to look at export sectors. You know, have those strategic pillars uh, clearly defined and 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 have national policies around increasing exports, like a Vietnam. So you, you run it for like 10, 15 years, then you see the exports growing and you know, narrowing the current account deficit or the balance of payment. That's the way you do it. You can't do it for five years, then you change it. Again, go into a different sector. You say this sector is important, the other sector is not important. As a country, we need to fig figure out uh, what is our play? What do we do as an export-oriented country? This notion, uh, I mean, this is uh, pretty much in the lay layman's mind, like they think that the rupee has to get stronger to levels of maybe 150 or 100 rupees. Is that is that a feasible thing even to think about? Because uh, what's the story of this forex rating when you take the rupee? Is it just going to depreciate, depreciate, depreciate? I mean, are we looking in another two, three years, 300 rupees, 400 rupees? Is this the story of this? So like I said, the emerging market currencies would always depreciate by 5 to 7%. Now you want to have a different that's, policy. That's a guarantee. Yeah, that's where it is going. But if you're if you're growing your economy also at you know six percent and you're growing exports at like twenty thirty percent, and your tourism arrivals is growing at a certain rate, uh, automatically you know you'll narrow the gap. The depreciation can come down. What happens is most of the time, even in India, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, a lot of these emerging market or middle income countries. Uh, because you are heavily dependent on fuel. Moment there's a fuel crisis, always there's 
you know uh, currency will depreciate and uh, you know there's inflation the the strategies you just uh, mentioned were uh, actually if things every external factor were exactly how it is right now and we move on in that particular path but what's the worst case scenario let's say ukraine uh, you know it goes into another two three months down the line there is a massive uh, impact on our oil prices we see a huge jerk in that price as well what exactly are you guys looking at right now is that the trend that you see in the world uh, what kind of advice do you usually give governments so we are closely monitoring the ukraine scenario as a bank we don't have an exposure in russia and we don't have a large exposure in those markets but we are definitely we are exposed to certain other sectors which has a linkage to russia so because of that we have a close look so we have research sessions happening every week um, but our take now is i mean we cannot really predict what's going to happen on, on a wall like that at this point so we're keeping a close eye and watching the markets carefully because we are a large asia africa middle east bank our business is in asia we are known for that uh, bingumal what's the worst case scenario for sri lanka right now so we are seeing the most difficult part of this cycle now uh, how long it will prolong with, with all these shortages you know it all depends on the cash flow like like i said before we need to understand whether we have enough you know cash flow to manage this in the next 3 to 4 months of course your july isb settlement now that's a commercial transaction you have to settle that uh, or you have to restructure that so you cannot go on that day and say we are not settling so i think as a government we have taken a much more honorable path compared to some of the countries like lebanon or zambia uh, settling the dues on time the challenge is how far can you go so i think time has come with all these external factors time has come either you work on a bilet bring that extra, extra dollars into the system then use that dollars for all the important sectors stabilize the economy let it grow and then you slowly open when you see the flows coming in the other option is definitely debt restructuring but now the way situation we are in we had to do some amount of debt restructuring the the for shape and form of that i think a consultant will have to advise whether you want to do i s d there are global consultants who will advise you on debt restructuring right i am talking about imf imf will come as a facilitator imf is always come as a this, monitor this facilitator this whole notion of going to imf uh, i i think uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, sketchy in in people's mind is it that imf is the one who gives us the amount of money or is the imf just a facilitator what exactly is the role that the imf going to play here because understanding that might give a good uh, indication to most of the people because we think IMF uh, is there in the US with a huge amount of money uh, in, in their coffers so we just have to go and tap on them and get that money and come back here uh, is that the case it doesn't work like that so IMF will always come as a facilitator they are really good in terms of fiscal reforms uh, sometimes front loaded so some countries have got into some amount of stress because of agreeing on on all these conditions but if you look at the past 30 years ago they used to give us a policy and we would implement but from that to now there's a good two way conversation so it's up to us to use our intellect and negotiate something good uh, for the country uh, in terms of fiscal fiscal side is very very critical i mean taxes have to go up there's no choice i don't think there's a choice on that one but to what level how do we look at it what are the sectors we want to exclude so that is a very important piece of that negotiation right, uh, right now which areas do you all think the taxes must must go so any any area is so a startups and you know the startups small businesses we have to be careful if you give us 50% of the economy moment you put pressure on the small businesses so you know uh, the economy will slow down we've seen that in the past then again there are growth sectors where we really want to support and grow you know and there are like you you spoke about how do we be a export oriented you know uh, country so there are certain exports that we want to take it to the next level maybe fisheries so there are different mm -hmm. sectors that we work in making maybe cinema and there are it's small but there's a lot of potential in terms of value add and all of that so the, we have to carefully analyze that and i am not a tax expert to advise on that but but imf is very good at uh, you know basically coming up with these programs but th what they will bring is discipline right they will always say devalue the currency which we have done tighten the monetary policy which we have done improve your fiscal policy which you have not done properly we done certain remove the certain price controls and things like that but on the tax side we have not done But, but, but let me finish so when imf comes you ask about how the money yeah. comes in so they will bring for a country like us uh, i can't exactly tell you a number but a small number i mean relatively is a 4 billion out of 4 billion 1 billion will come from imf that will also they'll give you in couple of years what will happen when imf comes in the multilats will come 
because there's you know some amount of governance and they can you know now come and put money into the system and they can rely on IMA for the whole monitoring ba part of it. Bilateral law investors. Multilats, multilats will come. Even bilats will come. I have seen even bilats getting activated. The moment there is IMF, for, for definitely when there is IMF program, you can always reach out to bilats and multilats for support. Also, the bond investors will come down, and you know if there is even a debt restructuring, bond investors will have some trust in the system because there is IMF program running. So that's 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 how you work with IMF. Not that IMF will give you a lot of money. Uh, one of the n negative things that has been said about the IMF is that apparently they are going to dictate uh, how our fiscal uh, policies, our economic policies are run in this country. It's never going to be our own choice. They will say do this, do that, uh, that kind of thing. Is that is that uh, something that you agree on? or what? So that's that? what I explained. The I I uh, early days I would say they have given us programs. Uh, there are multiple countries. We've gone there I think 16 times yeah, now. 16 times. Yeah, so Pakistan had gone there. Uh, yeah. Times, yeah. So, uh, but but now, I, at least in the last ten years, after the Argentina crisis and all of that, Argentina got into a yeah, yeah. tight situation. Two thousand one, after GFC, then Jamaica. So, uh, I think IMF is a two-way conversation. How you negotiate? How you uh, you know? Uh, then you, I also you had to look at scenario planning, right? You have a bilat negotiation happening. Okay, bilat is saying I'll give you this much money. I want X Y Z. IMF is saying I'll give you a program. I will you know guide uh, give you guidelines on these three areas. We had to put all of that together, and uh, and see what the story is and then how it impacts the long-term economy. It, that's how you uh, take a decision. All right, uh, I'm in um, conversation with uh, Mr. Bingumal Thevaradhanthriya, the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank uh, here in Sri Lanka. A lot more to discuss with regard to how, uh, what's the future, where do we go from here, what kind of ste immediate steps he's been talking about, uh, what we need to do right now, uh, what's their forecast, what does he think uh, this economy might happen if we do certain kinds of action. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. Uh, this is the special report on Sri Lanka's current economic crisis. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is the special report on Sri Lanka's current economic crisis. I'm in conversation with Mr. Bingumal Thevara Thantri, the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank uh, here in Sri Lanka. Uh, Mr. Bingumal, where do we go from here? What exactly, um, what are the key things that Sri Lanka, um, when it comes to the government per se, if, if, if Standard Chartered Bank has been called upon to advise, uh, what would be the advice that you all provide the government right now and also on the other side what would be the advice you provide to the people of this country because I'm sure lots of people might now come up with you know loan applications asking for credit and all that kinds of things what is your advice to, to all these parties yeah you see in terms of reforms uh, Mahesh I think we've done a lot of work uh, for the for the current situation like devaluation of currency but I, like I said we had to do some amount of intervention you cannot let it go about 250. I think they had to look at the debt pile and get into some level of debt restructuring. IMF is definitely an option. You can look at that. Uh, so I think what is needed is quick action. You have to take quick action, especially when, like I said, the traffic lights are very important. When you see your uh, your order books or your your credit lines drying, you have to take some quick calls. You know, on some of these decisions, that will be critical. And what is the urgent call that needs to be made right now, in your opinion? The bilet, the bilet negotiations, because we have some settlements to do, postponing those and to a, a comprehensive debt restructuring with an organization like IMF, ideally. And uh, beyond that? Beyond that, Mahesh, we have to take this opportunity and do all the reforms. Because going to IMF or debt restructuring is like you're going to the emergency room. You don't go to the emergency room 16 times for the same six sickness. Right? We've done that as a country. So this is a huge, massive opportunity for Sri Lanka to take this opportunity. We are in crisis. We also have opportunities, right? We have managed the pandemic well, right? One of the best, safest countries now. Tourists are coming in. Our flows are, at least from a revenue standpoint, uh, we have gone, gone to 40% of pre-pandemic level, 40 to 50%. It's a great story, right? So we have to now take the, of course, our export book is growing. We have our indigenous talent and uh, there's a FDI pipeline. So uh, what we have to do is now take this opportunity and do long-term reforms. 
we have very limited amount of tax files in this country so you cannot run with this you know single digit you know revenue number and 70% of the revenue goes for interest and more than that this year it's scary with this devaluation so uh, that has to stop so bleed has to stop uh, so you have to take some hard calls in terms of you know one the growth agenda the other one is a spending agenda so that that des that discipline if we can formulate and put that in the national policy and we all the governments can change but so that, uh, that has one been direction. one big issue isn't it um, every five years five years we keep changing our fiscal policy uh, our, our economic policy and, and no consistency has always been something that everybody has been pointed but we have never been able to successfully manage that and and is that something the business community is also uh, needing right now yeah probably this is the time this is the time countries have uh, done a complete change in crisis like this uh, there are good stories in some markets but there are all also bad stories. I don't want to mention the names of the countries. I mean, you've gone there, done re debt restructuring multiple times. You can go to LATAM, you check there are enough countries like that. So I think Sri Lanka should take the opportunity, take some courageous decisions. People also have to, you know, basically come midway uh, and work on a long term plan for Sri Lanka. If there is a businessman who, who, who has been impacted by this entire price structure, um, what would be the advice that you give? I'm not talking about the, the big big export markets and I'm talking about the small SMEs who are down there who's also been impacted by this. What would what would be, be your advice to them? So first thing is Mahesh, a lot of these corporates, have, you know, even the SM, larger part of the SMEs also uh, did reasonably well while some of the other SMEs actually suffered. So we also see the import driven SME sector as a vulnerable sector. My advice would be they should be now focusing on some area to generate some dollars. They should get into diversify their businesses to generate dollars. If they are always doing importing and selling something and you are exposed to this currency risk and suddenly the goods are not available because banks are not giving you dollars, that's not a good business model. Very clearly a lot of these corporates, I mean even SMEs have a side business into tourism or something mm -hmm. like that, which is great. I think we should all focus on generating more dollars, that level of that kind of business, apart from the, all the other critical imports that you do. Uh, so if you all do a non-essential imports and try to make money, that's not a sustainable economic model. Uh, right now, uh, there are certain aspects uh, in the economy uh, where we are thinking, uh, can we actually get out of this crisis? Uh, they're looking at what is the what would be a, a time frame would it be three months you said 18 months there could be repercussions of this but right now it feels like rock bottom uh, have we hit rock bottom or are we still falling we have seen the beginning of that you know uh, difficult time in my view a couple of weeks ago how fast we can come out of it all depends on the injection of you know injecting additional liquidity into the system that's you need a sh you know uh, a chunky amount to come to the system and stabilize the FX rate to everything and give confidence to people that don't worry, don't do panic buying, enough goods are available, uh, even for the importers, don't do stockpiling, you can import. That that confidence levels have come down, right? That's where people are trying to, even domestically, you see people trying to buy stuff, lock their, you know. Uh, uh, it's not helping. It's not helping. It's not helping at all. So that that can change only by injecting liquidity and we need to work on that. Uh, more loans? Yeah, more loans is not a bad idea right now. <laughs> uh, it's 130 plus, I think, now uh, debt to GDP. But when you're in a crisis like this, you have, might have to borrow more to come out of this. That's the reality you're in. Either you debt restructure, with, talk to your lenders and say, uh, you restructure or <coughs> you get a friendly nation to give you some money. Those are the options that you have. Even for businesses, when you run businesses, you, you get into crisis. Sometimes you get a bigger loan and restructure, you know, flatten all the short-term loans that can take a long term or that's pretty much debt restructuring a lot of customers do that so it's very common debt restructuring is not a bad thing it's just that how you do it and how you then bounce back after that is the question uh, going to IMF and actually uh, getting their support and also um, there are certain countries who used to help us is, is, is quite 
silent at the moment. Uh, I'm talking about China per se. China has not been uh, very active in terms of this economic crisis. We see in other times when there is an economic crisis in Sri Lanka, they are always there to help. So there is that, that political conversation occurring on the other side. But financially, for China, uh, would that be uh, going to the IMF is something against Chinese policies or would we lose a friend there? Or what do you think in terms of their economic uh, policies mm -hmm. and advisory and, and the decision to go to IMF, it does that tally? I don't want to comment on China's you know, view on IMF, but what we've seen with uh, some of the emerging markets, China has continuously worked with those markets when they're in IMF program. So I don't think, uh, you know, that will lose be a friend. No. That's the same. Uh, bank, banking sector, um, right now, the sector that you are in, uh, is uh, uh, what kind of support that they need to do in terms of uh, ensuring that, you know, there's stability in the economy because the banks are the, are the fundamental pillars of, of, of uh, ensuring stability in, in the market. So what kind of uh, steps have you all taken in order to ensure that? So my first thing is banking sector is very stable in Sri Lanka, right? Our non-performing, right yes, yes, non-performing loans are less than 5%. Our capital adequacy ratios are good. We have some stress coming our way because some of these import-led customers might go into stress, but the tourism sector is bouncing back with some clients, you know, not bouncing back. So banking sector will do what we have done before. Now we've managed the pandemic, we manage these attacks, right? So we'll carefully look at all those vulnerable sectors and make sure that they are given enough time to settle and there, there can be debt restructuring for those clients as well. Uh, I think banks have done reasonably well in the last two years supporting uh, the moratoriums and you know the impacted sectors. No, not to go back on the conversation, but you know, restructuring debt means there's a huge amount of interest rate coming into the conversation, isn't it? Like if we are to pay it in three months and we are asked for another additional three months, there's going to be a huge amount of interest. In no, actually the whole What's idea the of restructuring debt is to reduce the interest rate. So you have high cost, uh, sometimes short term loans, you make it term, even for the country, you have all these little little arrangements that you have in the ISB portfolio and the IFB portfolio interest rate is much higher compared to bilets. So debt restructuring means there's a haircut. There's a haircut on interest, there's a haircut on capital and ex all of that. So it depends on how you structure it. Uh, debt restructuring doesn't mean that you always go into a high interest territory. Mm -hmm. Because that's the uh, point of view that most has that mean uh, as soon as you restructure or whatever the time frame that you're asking for that, we have to pay a huge amount of interest. Uh, that conversation is actually a safeguarding conversation where we can pretty much say this is what we can do. Yeah. Mahesh, the thing is you need to understand the cash flow. So if you don't have the money to pay, pointless talking about the mm. total interest they will pay in 20 years, right? It's, it's very important that you manage your cash flow for the next two years. So debt postponement is very good, right? Now that interest will get piled up. I mean, the, in yeah. the moratorium as it happened, that you pay it late, that's restructuring. So uh, we don't have a lot of choices right now. It's very important that we run the country without these, uh, you know, cues and don't make this external problem an internal problem. And then, uh, you know, don't impact tourism and exports and the important sectors. So we bounce back because tourism is generally backloaded. Most of our tourists come after September and you will see, you know, 200, 300,000 tourists coming in. Already for a month, we are tracking $240 million of income, right? This is from a 400 million pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. So just imagine the, the, I mean, we also rated well in a lot of the travel magazines by different organizations yeah, yeah. like CNN. So there's a massive opportunity for Sri Lanka. And, and if you compare with Thailand, they're getting close to 40 million tourists. We were getting 2 million tourists before the pandemic. So 2 million going to at least to a 5 million is not far. Mm. So we should not lose the opportunity uh, at this point. W what are the other issues. sectors? I, I, I'm, uh, we need to wrap up, but what are the other sectors that you see that has an opportunity in this particular crisis? Because we're always talking about tourism, we're always talking about export markets, all that, but what are the other sectors that can, that has yeah. a golden opportunity Maish, that can... Yeah, Maish, we are a small market, we're a 20 million market. Whatever you produce, you have to sell it for 20 million people. We have 1.2 billion out there. And with the whole region is more than one and a half billion, Pakistan, Bangladesh together. So our market is that. So if we can do market expanding FDIs, you bring in an investor to manufacture something in Sri Lanka and take it back to the region. Now people will say it's very difficult to go to India and all that. We've seen very successful business models penetrating into India. Uh, some clients Are you manage talking about Southern India per se or southern, the whole of India? Uh, predominantly Southern, but done very well in India. There are, there are customers. 
and there are people who have done very well in Bangladesh, yeah, even Pakistan. So, and even East Africa for that mm -hmm. matter, there's a Komesa Sadek together, there's about 600 people, right? So there's a huge opportunity for us at this point. We are not looked at the East, we are not looked at China. So we should bring in investors who will do something here, manufacture, evaluate, take it out. Of course, the environment has to change, the rating has to change, policies have to change, uh, labor laws to all those things will have to change to attract those investments. I'll take you one example. So Samsung moved from Korea to Vietnam. Everything changed in Vietnam after that. That's how Vietnam became export-oriented country. So we need to bring a catalyst. We need one catalyst to come. We've seen some coming in in the IT space. So it started in some form. Not enough. Maybe uh, we have to do more in order to entice these kinds of investors to come into Sri Lanka and also actually capitalize on the regional um, aspects of things. Uh, not just look at, look at this issue we are in right now, but the whole picture in general and actually be part of this whole, whole global, because that's where we are trying to go, right? Uh, with uh, Port City and all coming in, we want to be a regional hub. So with all these kinds of policies that is being a, a, a bottleneck, we need to pretty much bring, because we have a different type of a financial policy going in for the port city I think that would be the best model to be adopted to the to the rest of the country as well is that a feasible thing you think so port city I think what the other problem is we have a domestic book, book to protect so they want to you know create right. space for these investors to come and have a free flow of capital uh, that's not a bad idea a lot of countries have done that uh, it's just that in order to take take off you need to get the rating upgrade that's the most important thing for that you need to take the reserves up so i think the immediate uh, before we even think about large investment from especially from oecd market mm -hmm. some investors will come from this part of the world you already seen investors coming into the ports and things like that it's important that we work on the current problem next six months is crucial for sri lanka hopeful absolutely hopeful Mr. Bingubal Tevarathantri, the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank, thank you very much uh, for that conversation and giving us a good uh, uh, idea about where we are right now and what needs to be done in terms of the financial sector, the banking sector, and also economically looking at the whole whole problem rather than not, um, you know, screaming, shouting, and <laughs> uh, acting hysterically, but uh, break it down, try to figure out what solutions need, uh, need to be going on. Thank you once again uh, for your time. Thanks, Mahesh, for having me. All right, uh, that's all the time we have for you on this special report on Sri Lanka's economic crisis. We'll be back again tomorrow at the same time at around 10 o'clock in the night uh, to, with another guest to give you uh, an update about where we are and where we're going from. I'm Mahesh Johnny from Colombo. Good night.